All right, hello everyone. This is Liz Brower again for module three, part two uh, for your plant immunity uh, course, fall 2020. So today we're talking about SAR and ISR. And both of these are uh, part of the systemic immunity of plants. And so basically um, this is how plants communicate from one sort of infected tissue to a distal tissue, completely uninfected tissue and activate defense responses in the distal tissue to uh, produce broad, sort of broad spectrum resistance. Um, so the two forms that we have in plants are induced systemic resistance or ISR and systemic acquired resistance, SAR. So the difference between these two things is basically that induced systemic resistance isn't produced by root colonization by beneficial microbes. So there's quite a few microbes that we'll, we'll talk about with Allison pretty soon um, that actually promote the growth of the plant um, during colonization here. And those actually also induce um, a form of resistance. So uh, systemic acquired resistance is specifically activated by pathogens. Um, and there's a couple of other sort of small differences between them as well. One is that ISR is independent of salicylic acid whereas SAR is dependent on salicylic acid. Um, both of them involve unknown um, mobile signals, although I, with the case ISR, we don't have a lot of candidates. SAR, you'll see there's quite a few that have been discovered, um, but no single one seems to be the key signal. And in both cases, SAR and ISR are both prime defense gene expression. Um, and so again, these are the beneficial microbes that can colonize the roots of plants. And you can see they really change the root architecture here. And they're making the leaves grow a little bit faster, a little bit fuller. And what they're actually doing is um, infecting the roots here or um, just colonizing the roots growing around them and uh, producing some sort of signal that moves to the leaves. And these leaves are, mm, are altered in such a way that they're primed for producing callus much quicker and also for um, producing jasmonic acid or ethylene based defense uh, gene expression much faster. This seems to involve NPR1, which we talked about in the context of being the, the uh, receptor for salicylic acid. So SAR by contrast uh, is dependent on SA in the primary infection site. It's usually initiated by the hypersensitive response, but there are cases where um, MAP triggered immunity will also induce SAR. And again, we have a mobile signal moving to distal tissues, but in the case of SAR, that's inducing salicylic acid and salicylic acid-based uh, defense gene expression. So these are called uh, pathogenesis-related genes or PR genes, and these are actually um, pretty effective at producing resistance in lots of different types of plants and not just for SAR but in general. If we overexpress them for example we see pretty good disease resistance uh, depending on the pathogen. So this occurs within about 46 hours after infection. Um, the signal moves through the phloem um, and the big question mark has always been what is the mobile signal that's producing this type of response? Uh, we do know that there's sort of two different branches of SAR. One is seems to be SA dependent. The other is nitrous oxide dependent in terms of the signal that's produced in the primary infection site, excuse me. Now there's been multiple signals found as, sh as I'll show you. So I'll just talk about one of them today. Um, uh, modified salicylic acid is in one of these signals and seems to be um, produced in the primary tissue and then moves through the phloem to the secondary tissue and has to be converted back to salicylic acid by this enzyme here, SABP2, um, for the SAR to work. And so this is an, just an experiment showing that, uh, proving that point, that when you have the knockout for that SABP2, you see disease. Uh, this is a tobacco mo mosaic virus. Um, so normally when you um, prime with salicylic acid in the primary infection site, you would see no disease in the secondary infection site, which is what this leaf is. This is the wild type version. 
Whereas you knock out that gene and you all of a sudden you see more infection in the secondary infection site. So this is just basically to show that you need this enzyme in that secondary infection site in order to have effective SAR. So what this seems to be doing is actually converting this back to SA. So here's just a very broad overview of what happens uh, in this process. In the primary infection site, we have HR, for example. So we'll have um, some part of the lesion will be producing so much salicylic acid that basically the receptor NPR1 will monomerize, it will move into the nucleus and it will um, bind with NPR3 and it will be degraded. And this will allow for um, programmed cell death to occur. Now in sites where there's a little bit less salicylic acid accumulation, you have monomerization of NPR1 again, it goes into the nucleus, but instead of being degraded, um, it's no longer bound by this NPR4, and it's able to bind to transcription factors and activate gene expression. And so that's how you generate sort of um, immune responses in this primary infection site. So in addition to that, it's also producing all of these mobile signals. Um, I'm not going to talk about them too much today. It's complicated, um, but they, they move between the leaves and the phloem. They activate our PR genes to suppress uh, secondary infection. They actually also affect DNA, DNA damage responses um, and priming of just um, gene expression. And some of these things can actually be passed between generations. So a parent plant can actually sort of prime the immune responses in um, uh, the seeds, the next generation, um, by going through this process. Uh, but the mechanisms involved in that are still a little bit unclear. So in addition to just our understanding of how this works, we've taken advantage of this phenomenon in agriculture in a couple of different ways. So there's actually uh, salicylic acid analogs called BTH, for example. These are things that you have been patented and that you can buy as a farmer um, in order to spray onto your plants and activate your plant's immune system. Usually it's for specific um, like high value crops like tomatoes, as opposed to just spraying fields all the time. That, that wouldn't really work against <laughs> pathogens all the time because you would be reducing your yield by doing that as well. But there's also protective micro mixtures that are kind of like a microbiome for the plant that you're selling to farmers. And this mixture of microbes um, are basically some of those microbes that induce ISR and will produce a growth benefit, um, but will also activate um, the immune system in theory and will also protect against um, plants. So um, I think this is being developed currently. This is kind of a hot area in terms of industry. Um, and in some cases it seems to work well, in some cases it doesn't. And I think part of the problem with using this is, is of course the environment always comes into play and uh, plant pathogen interactions are as complicated. And when you involve an extra microbe, um, it can be complicated, but uh, it also can work <laughs> sometimes. So, um, so the jury's still out on that a little bit. Okay, so I will talk to you soon for our next journal club on Friday. See you then.